items are getting costlier for Nigerians as prices climb higher, fueling hunger and taking a big bite out of consumers' wallets. The average food prices have surged by over 70% since January, according to a business day survey across major markets in Lagos, on the back of lingering insecurity challenges, climate change impact and an acute dollar squeeze. With the constant surge in prices, food alone now accounts for 70% of most Nigerians' monthly income. A 2023 data compiled by Picodi, an international e-commerce organization, stated that Nigerian households spent 59% of their income on food, the highest globally. Well, Arise Business Anchor, Bosun Omofaye, joins us now to discuss that story and others. Thank you so much for joining us on Newsday. Thank you, thank you Tabe. It's, it's good to have me again on your show. Now, the World Trade Organization says Nigeria has lost its leading position in the mm -hmm. agriculture export markets. What's your take on this? Well, I, I'm not too sure that is news, but, but shouldn't be surprising. Uh, every news is news, is what it is. But whether it is surprising is anyone's guess if you live within the four corners of, of um, of this country in terms of uh, uh, their ability. And we've been around this for quite some time um, uh, in terms of why and how our products, agricultural products, basically are rejected in Europe, whether it's yam, um, uh, beans, and a few other uh, items. Again, standard is standards, and, and, and we're not the only one uh, doing uh, uh, exports of food products anyway across Africa. You do very huge uh, flour, vegetables from East Africa. And these folks are making a mountain of money because they're sticking to standards. $1.1 billion was what East African countries did last year in vegetables exports alone to Asia, to, to, to US and Western Europe. If you look at the COVID-19 pandemic period, Kenya made a mountain of money out of just sending flowers, hibiscus, flowers, what other kind of flowers, to the rest of the world. Again, basically to Europe and elsewhere, because folks were just sending flowers to families and friends who lost loved ones and sending to those who are hospitalized because you can't visit them. So part of the, even the national carrier, which is Kenya Airways, had to convert some of its commercial aircraft to cargo aircrafts because folks were not flying. So because there were so much restrictions uh, and all of that. So they got to convert it to cargo because they were exporting so much flowers to the rest of the world. Now, what does that tell me? If they're not meeting, stan if they're not meeting standards uh, in terms of those exports, agricultural products, whether it is tea, by some of the companies listed on the exchange and those who are not listed, they wouldn't be making so much, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars every year. Now, what's the problem here in Nigeria? We're good at trying to push things out, but the issue of standard is key. So what have we seen recently was the Africa Zim Bank, uh, uh, and, and I think at one of these international uh, verification uh, testing company internationally set up this uh, facility in Ogun State, which is the first of its kind in Africa, uh, which now means that every product that uh, agri products that we want to export out of Nigeria can go to around Shagamu area. That's where it's located. Uh, it was officially flagged off uh, towards the end of last administration, and then. Uh, they can provide a kind of standard testing and what have you, this quality assurance that we need to take our products out. And I hope our folks are taking advantage of that and not trying to, buy, to bypass, uh, bypass that and try just to ship or cargo these things out without going through proper testing and, and quality uh, assurance. And this is very important because no one is going to uh, 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 pay for anything that is of low quality. They're not going to consume it. Now, what are some of the other problems we have here? Now, this is now beyond, if you test, for example, in Shagamu, Abekuta, wherever the, the facility is, and then it takes you so long to get it to a papa port, for example, and then it takes so long, perhaps you need to test on Monday and get it out by Friday. But between those five days, you haven't even gotten into a papa port, for example, your container is hanging somewhere between... Um, uh, a papa, whatever, my 12, whatever, my two, hasn't gotten there. So you would have lost that quality testing certificate you've got because it's got, it's got a date on it, like your, your, like, well, your testing, you've got a date, like an expiry date. So you've got to move it very quickly out of the testing place, then you move it to the seaport, then you cargo, uh, uh, you put it in, the, you containerize it, 
and that goes out of the country as quickly as possible. As long as you have, whether it is road, customs, whatever, police, legal and illegal people on the road, <laughs> stopping you for half a day, a couple of hours, and what have you, and the conditions from which you took these products from the factory testing to the time that you put it back on the ship to start sailing out of Nigerian waters also matters. So our environment, our climate is completely is this different from the rest of Europe. So if it has to be at certain temperature from the factory testing to the time it goes to the container and on the container all the way on the ship to destination in Europe or wherever it's going in the world, all these are part of the processes. So sometimes it's not because we don't do testing here. A few testings are gone. But again, we have infrastructure issue. If you test out of the laboratory and you don't have the appropriate uh, 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 facility to, uh, to, to keep them cool or, or, or frozen or whatever it has to be, uh, if you put yams, for example, and you test it here and it's okay, whether it's in Ondo State, Ogun State, Delta State, Kwara State, Kogi State, and you're taking it to the seaport and you keep it in a container tightly coupled with heat and humidity inside it, you're spoiling those yams. By the time you take them all the way to, you cargo rise it and you take it all the way out. By the time it gets to Europe, anywhere in the world, it's no longer the same quality sure. of yam that you're gonna have. So we have this whole of rejection coming through. What do we need to do? I love what the world WTO is doing. And I want to say thank you to uh, Dr. Nguzo Okonji Uweala uh, as a Nigerian born head of the WTO, but she can do just much. Our trade minister of industry, trade, and, 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 and investment need to be on top of this. The, 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 the whole Export Promotion Council need to be on top of this. The various chambers of commerce and farmers association, whatever, have to be on top of this and ensure that, yes, we can uh, actually uh, get our products out at the quality, at the time, and because we need the FX back here, uh, and we need it very urgently. Well, very well said. Now, as prices of food increase daily in Nigeria, what should the government do as a matter of urgency? And is there a way to bring down prices that are up already? Well, uh, what should the government do? Well, the government is trying to do something, try to provide food interventions. But again, um, we need not just to distribute food, but we need to show people how to fish for themselves. So what are some of the quick ways? And I'll just mention two. You've got schools in Nigeria, and I mean public schools, that's got arable land across the country, hundreds of thousands of them, secondary schools and universities, public institutions. How come we don't have those farms f working again? They used to work when folks like us were in secondary school or modern school or college or what you call it, in which schools have poultry, some schools had fish farms, some had uh, 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 vegetable, corn, cassava farms. Do they still do? Every Wednesday, which is today, it's agriculture day when we were in secondary school and you've got to line up in the morning with your cutlasses and hose all raised up on the, on the assembly and be sure to go straight to the farm. And today you can sell maize, corn, whatever it is that are grown on school farms to the local environment. You bring down rural inflation. You can still decide that we're going to dedicate Wednesdays or Thursdays or Fridays across Nigeria for public schools for students to go to the farm, back to farm. If we do that, that will help. In those days when you do some sporting activities, you go to the school farm, the teachers go to the school farm, and corn or maize will be shared to students of secondary school to take back home. Those things are gone. Now, every school wants to run business centers and photocopy centers and whatever ICT centers around the school, where the school farms had all been converted into other commercial shopping rights or shop, whatever everybody's doing, shopping complex around. And we get to a point in which even students in schools, they could use part of the school facilities to plant, okay, basic crops. Can't do them any longer. Then you've got universities. How many universities of agriculture do we have? in Nigeria, from Akure to Abe Okuta to wherever, you've got almost a dozen of universities of agriculture. Are we targeting these schools, some of them with hot, several hectares of land to cultivate food at the various level and sell those food through the school to the local community and be part of it? These schools in a large part of Nigeria are not under any form of insecurity. So why are we, what are we doing with these schools? Then you got my second point and the final point on that is the Bank of Agriculture. The Bank of Agriculture is currently, according to sources, going through some management, reworking and re... Look, this, that institution had been docile and dormant for too long. 
Bank of Agriculture in Nigeria should be like the Bank of Industry. A Bank of Agriculture should have a branch in every state capital and in every local government capital in Nigeria. They should be giving loans to farmers, to women, to those who want to do every form of activities within the value chain in agriculture. Those are very quick wins. If you recapitalize Bank of Agriculture by 1 trillion naira today or 500 billion naira, and you ask the Bank of Agriculture to do bonds on the stock market or ask international agencies like AFDB, Afrexin Bank, the World Food Organization, the FAO, and others to pitch in and then give what you call, we're talking about student loan. What about loans to women and farmers through the Bank of Agriculture? The Bank of Agriculture should be like a, 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 like a microfinance bank that every womb, everybody who is at the agri level in Nigeria should be able to walk into with a very small digit interest rate loan and be able to secure that. Even students should be able to go to Bank of Agriculture as a student of OAU or Uniben, wherever, and say, look, I have a small farm, I'm doing poultry. You can verify it at the local school community and you can give 100,000, 200,000, 50,000 naira loan to these students, male and female, students of agriculture in those universities to pursue agricultural production. Why is food production such a difficult thing for 200 million people? And we keep saying, look, it's insecurity. Insecurity is not in every university and every school in Nigeria. We can use what we have to feed ourselves and decelerate food inflation. But the, what we're doing right now hasn't really started scratching the surface, and we need to do that. On a small individual scale, we can use schools and women and corporate societies to ramp up on agriculture and small loans through the Bank of Agriculture, if we're really interested in doing it, it's not difficult. Give Bank of Agriculture entire thing that the Central Bank had been doing through Anchors Borrowers Program, for example, and onboard it to the Bank of Agriculture and let them do it on a retail basis. States, local governments, communities, all the way down to villages. It's as simple as that. Well, or maybe simple. it's not as simple, but I think it's as simple as that. <laughs> well, it sounds simple, but... Hey, yeah, you never can tell this is Nigeria. Just make it simple. Well, let's quickly move on to South Africa. The electricity minister says an anticipated improvement in electricity supply should see him out of job by the end of this year. Uh, I, I, want, I want to be out of job if I can. <laughs> but right now I need my job. So I hope my, my chairman is not listening. But yeah, again, you need it. We, we, if, you, if you do your job well, mm -hmm. you remember, just about a year ago was when President Ramaphosa brought in this, or created this office. It's not even up to a year and brought in a special person and said, look, you, the Minister of Electricity, your job is not to deal with power, just ensure we have 24 hours electricity, there's stable electricity in South Africa, that's your job. You have just one single mandate, not two, one single sentence on a piece of paper. Don't get involved in anything else, just give me that. And now the Minister is saying, I'll be out of job by the end of the year because my job is almost done. Look, it's not, his job is not to award contracts for electricity in South Africa, his job is to ensure that we get electricity. Who should be doing that for us in Nigeria? Within our own electricity value chain. Of course, you have the Electricity Regulatory Commission. We have so many agencies in there that overlapping. So you're not too sure who is doing it. Who is harassing the discos and the jenkos? Who wants to ensure that we have electricity that is stable, that there is enough power by the jenkos? The minister is talking about 6,000 megawatts at some point from 4,000 where we are because he said the jenkos had what it takes. But again, it's neither here nor there. So South Africa is providing this. And I think I said it on your show here over the last one week or two that these folks seem to be getting their acts together in terms of electricity. They transmit as even a logistical problem. They're getting help internationally to resolve that, to resolve the manufacturing, mining, logistics, infrastructure, seaport congestion, whether it's in Durban or it's elsewhere in Cape Town, wherever in South Africa. So if the minister says, look, I'm soon be out of job because electricity supply is stable, hello, maybe we need him here. Maybe we can just hire him. <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind. Look, look, President Kagame is doing a similar thing in, in Rwanda. He hires the best person, wherever you are from Africa, and helps you to do his country to do the job. So maybe we need this electricity minister from South Africa on a loan for just maybe one year or two. Well, we might need him because I know an average Nigerian does not want to be out of job. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, but if he comes here and do it, we can just pay him well and then we bid him good by once the is stable. But I think South Africa is just showing my good example. All right, Mr. Sankar, thank, thank you, you. Thank thank you, you so much me. for joining thank us on Tuesday.